The following podcast is brought to you by the Arthur Miller Society. Please visit us at arthurmillersociety.net for more information. That is a one million dollar idea. What we could do is push these more current interpretations to show that the women are just a hell of a lot stronger than the men. Hi, welcome to the Arthur Society podcast. Speaking from Jaipur, India, my name is Ambika Singh. I am joined by my co-host, Kiron Lanster from Dublin, Ireland. Hello, Kiron. How are you doing today? Hey, Ambika. I'm doing really well, thanks. Uh, last week, we had our national holiday here in Ireland, St. Patrick's Day. So while it was really strange for the city centre to be completely empty, because normally we have people flying in from all over the world, uh, at least it was nice to have a day off. How are things with you? Oh, I'm doing very fine. It's just getting very hot here in India. Uh, but apart from this, everything is fine. And I'm glad you got a day off. For today's episode, I'm quite excited because we are marking the fact that March is Women's History Month in the US, in the UK and Australia. And we are going to be talking about the female characters in the plays of Arthur Miller. Speaking of which, what is your opinion on the female characters in Miller's plays, Kiran? Well, I think it's a funny one because he's often considered to be a writer who doesn't know, or maybe even care, a whole lot about the women in his plays. And while there are definitely times when the female characters aren't extremely well fleshed out, they do generally have really critical roles. And then as we get later into his career, I think he has some really interesting female characters. For instance, and we're going to talk about this, I love the ride down Mount Morgan and the way he has so much fun with sexuality here, and then also the complexity of his female characters. Oh, I agree with you there, Kieran. I think his late plays are particularly very interesting for his female characters. Sylvia Gelberg, for instance, in Broken Glass. I feel that Miller's plays are not particularly women-centric. Of course, that's the popular opinion. However, I also feel that Miller based his portrayals on what he saw around him, And I see it as a realistic portrayal of women and not a demeaning one particularly. There is a lot I feel that can be said about women in Miller's life and his plays. To take the discussion further, we are going to be joined today by senior Arthur Miller scholar and founding editor of the Arthur Miller Society newsletter, Dr. Jane K. Dominic. Jane has taught 17 different courses at San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton, California, designing eight of those, including courses in play and screenwriting. She earned her BA in English and teaching credentials in English, speech, drama, and French at the University of the Pacific, her MA in English Literature and Language at the University of Chicago, her MFA in Theatre, Directing, and Stage Management at Rutgers University, and her PhD at the University of East Anglia. She wrote her doctoral dissertation on the staging of Arthur Miller's drama under the supervision of Professor Christopher Bigsby. During her tenure at Delta College, Jane began a student essay magazine, wrote program notes for more than two dozen productions, directed two showcases for her play and screenwriting students, and hosted the seventh International Arthur Miller Conference. Her three sabbaticals focus on comparative education, writer's block, markets for freelance writers, interning for five movie production companies in Hollywood, and creativity and creative thinking. She was awarded both the New Educator and Distinguished Faculty Member Awards at the college. Currently, she is Vice President of the Arthur Miller Society, And we began by asking if she thought Miller's female characters have been too often ignored by both critics and theatre practitioners. Obviously, the plays are focused on the male characters. And with one or two exceptions, arguably, uh, Broken Glass comes to mind, for example, the protagonists are male characters and the focus is on them. Um, And I don't see that that's a problem. Um, I don't think that a writer has to write about all characters equally in any play or any literary work. I don't think that's what what literature is about. That being said, um, the the women characters, I think, are very strong. Um, They're actually, I think, very complex. Um, My view on them, um, and a couple of people have already disagreed with me about this, but I'll just assert this anyway. My view on them is that as the male characters were being created, that the female characters in many of the plays are a kind of backdrop, a kind of foil. Um, That is to say that as the male protagonist is trying to work out his conflicts and his issues, that then the female characters have to respond kind of according to what he's trying to work out. 
I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I'm not saying that in any kind of uh, denigrating way. And in fact, what it means is that the women characters are not only strong, but they're incredibly complex. And in some ways, the, the moves between their different intentions or different actions are a lot quicker than they are for the, for the male characters. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a kind of a, a subtlety to a lot of their movements that can be lost, um, definitely on one viewing or reading anyway. Um, but let's start by looking at, at his most famous female character, Linda Lohman. This yeah. is the woman that Charlotte Otten called a mousy 20th century Brooklyn housewife who, like Jocasta and Oedipus Rex, prevents her husband from asking the fateful question, who am I? David Savran, meanwhile, called Linda the most acquiescent female character of modern American drama. Um, so these are pretty strong statements. And where do you stand on these? And how much of this do you think depends on the actor's interpretation of the role? Um, first of all, on the page, even on the page, never mind on the stage, I, I disagree with those assessments, to be honest. And you're right, they're pretty strong. Um, first of all, the women largely sometimes are seen through the male protagonist who's trying to understand his own life as well as his relationships with everyone around him, including the women in his life. Second, a lot of the plays, of course, are located in a particular time period in which the views of women, the expectations of women, the uh, subjugation of women um, was what was happening in, in American society, certainly. Um, if you go back, you know, 70 years or so. And um, certainly then the women can be frustrated, but we, we see that frustration um, in those roles, as well as, again, when, uh, when the women take a, a, a larger part in other plays. Um, and even now, I would assert, unfortunately, I mean, we're in the year 2021, and I'm still amazed at how women are viewed and then how they view themselves, and then how they think that they need to behave to, uh, to, to fit into a certain expectation. But at the same time, the men have their pressures as well. Um, what is it to be a man? How do you be a successful American? Uh, what is it to mean to be a good husband, a strong man, a good father, and, and um, everything else? So I, I think it's a mix of those. So, so those two comments I, I find a little perplexing, um, a little myopic, to be um, quite honest. Um, and I also think, too, it's very complicated because um, if women marry and have children, and then they cannot work for a number of reasons, um, whether it's time, whether it's again, expectation, they are dependent upon that husband to be successful. So yes, you could say, okay, Linda in some ways, Kate Keller in All My Sons, <clears throat> excuse me, are enabling their husbands, but they've got to support them so that the husbands can be successful so that they are also protected um, economically as well. Um, which is kind of a, a vicious cycle that it would be nice for us to, to all get out of. Um, and then the other question um, that comes to mind too is in terms of say um, the, the suicides of these men um, and, and you know, why doesn't Linda stand up more strongly to uh, Willie and challenge him about this, you know, with, and confront him with that rubber hose, for example. And, and she kind of tries to, to, you know, she's worried about those car accidents and stuff. But at the same time, even now, 75 to 80 years later, when we have the benefit of modern psychology, when in the last few years, especially, there's so much discussion in the United States and worldwide about mental health. Um, even now, if any of us knows someone personally who is, is, is thinking about committing suicide, how do you approach that person? so that you don't shame that person, so that you don't push them over the edge, but that you don't enable them. And so I think, again, some of the criticisms that have been raised or asserted about Linda in particular um, are, are perplexing to me. And I, I, again, I think a little short-sighted to be quite honest. Um, and then when you ask about the, the actor's interpretation, certainly in more recent productions of this play and um, of All My Sons, I would also say, that I think there is more sensitivity to the women's roles. I think there is more um, strength um, that the directors and the actors are seen in them. Um, 
And in fact, I think this is a little bit of a change because I'm noticing more what I guess, for lack of a better word, positive recognition of the complexity and strength of the women's roles from theater practitioners than necessarily I do from literary critics, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, because I, in anticipation of this, you know, I was I was updating my own research on women characters, and I noticed that yeah, the theater people are very kind of you know tugging at that to say, wait a minute, let's look at these women again. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that's correct. Uh, did you see the Bill Pullman and Sally Field version of All My Sons at the Old Vic? I did not. Did you? Yeah, well, I, I saw it. They played it at the National Theatre Live, so they played it in the cinema a couple of years ago here in Dublin. And yeah, Sally Field played Kate almost like a hysterical, sinister witch, you know, that she was really the the spine of it. It was a really strong performance, really gives that character more depth and more, almost more brutality, which I thought was great. Right. I mean, it, she's really, I mean, in some ways, she's more perplexing and perhaps more interesting with these interpretations than Linda in the sense that to what degree, I mean, she knows, she knows what her husband has done. Now Linda is aware of what her husband's doing, but it's not directly hurting other people out there in terms of morality. Right. Um, But, but Kate knows what her husband has done. So to what degree, and I know I was talking with Steve Marino a few days ago and, and he was saying, you know, she's, she's culpable. And then I would push back on that a little bit. I think it's a great point that that Steve Marino made in our discussion. But then I would push back a little bit because, again, Kate is dependent upon her husband in that factory um, to survive, just as that's why Joe Keller, one of his justifications, which has some merit to it, is that, you know, if I don't ship out the parts, we go under. We have no factory. We have no home. We have nothing. And so you know, one of the things I appreciate about great drama, Miller in particular, is when the characters are stuck in a corner, what choice do you make? You know, and I talk about that with my students saying it's when you're in a corner, you have some really tough decisions to make about your ethics, about who you are, about what you're willing to sacrifice to follow those ethics or not. I think uh, I I agree on this uh, part that Miller's portrayal of women is not particularly demeaning, but it's rather real. It's more realistic portrayal of what he saw in the society, the associations that he had with women. And also all around him, it was not that women were, you know, being given an equal place everywhere else and he was demeaning them in his place. So getting back to Linda Lohman, you played Linda in a community college production in the spring of 2015. Uh, So had you done much acting before this? Did this experience alter your perception of the character? And can you tell us about the entire process? Um, Yes. So um, I trained in directing at Rutgers University. And as part of that program, um, we took a number of um, actor training courses. Um, And I was very lucky because I took from a few different professors and each one had a different method that he or she preferred uh, for the Americanized method acting um, schools. And so it was really, uh, it was uh, one, uh, actually a part-time professor um, and it was Uta Hagen's method that really um, made sense to me and clicked in. And so, you know, over the years I've done, you know, small bits here and there. And then um, at my college, Harvey um, Jordan was retiring from the drama department And he wanted to put, I had heard through a colleague, he was going to put on Death of a Salesman. And my ear kind of perked up and I thought about it. And for some reason, and I, and I don't say this with any kind of arrogance at all, to be honest, but I just had this gut feeling that I needed to play that role in that production at that time. And so I I asked him, is it appropriate? You know, I'm a faculty member. Is it um, out of the department? I'm in the English department. Is it appropriate for me to audition? And he said, sure. And so I auditioned um, and was was given the the role. And, um, you know, every director uses a different process of directing. So his was different from what I'd experienced and and, um, in some ways, you know, how I direct. But it was fascinating. And he I have to give him a lot of credit because I don't know that every director, to be honest, and I've never spoken to him about this, would have cast me knowing 
how much background that I have in Miller. Um, someone might have been, you know, a little uncomfortable with that, and he wasn't at all, um, which was great. And um, then he also brought in a former student, uh, Brian Gray from Chicago, who's a professional actor, and he played Biff. Um, and and the process, I mean, you know, we we went through the rehearsal process, and um, it was interesting because I know I've been asked since, how does that compare to writing about Miller? And for a number of reasons, I haven't quite put that together. And now when I was thinking about that <clears throat> the last few days, I'm not sure I want to put it together, but certainly approaching the role is completely different from analyzing. You're, you're looking at it through one character's uh, perspective and you ask a series, at least I do, a series of different questions. There are questions you ask, as you, as you both know, um, when you are analyzing a play in its whole, all the characters, the structure, the symbols, all of that very set, different set of questions you asked as an actor. And so I just stayed in, in that realm. Now, certainly I already knew the play very well, so that helped. But in some ways, then you have to also, I had to disengage part of not just the analytical bent of my mind, but also what I knew. Um, because otherwise then I'm acting Linda, who's aware of everything and Linda's not aware of everything. And I, I think, you know, one of the, the best compliments that I received, um, it, we, we did it in a very small theater. So the audience literally in the dark, when I went on stage one time uh, to lie in the bed, I tripped over somebody's legs in the audience who had them out. We, there were only about three feet between the stage and the audience member. And one of the best compliments I, I remember, uh, there were two um, administrative assistants from my department who had known me for decades and they were three feet from me. <laughs> and they said, the next time I saw them, they said, you know what, after three minutes, we completely forgot it was you. And I thought, okay, I did the job because they're that close. And if they've known me that well, and they're not theater goers necessarily at all. So yeah, so it was completely different. Um, what I did notice, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, is the, the one thing I became really aware of that I hadn't quite when I was reading and analyzing the play over the years, is again, those quick changes for Linda. You know, she's, she's worried and, and, and cautioning Willie, and then she's, she's trying to, you know, support him, and then she's warning him you know, about different things about Biff. And then she's kind of commanding what you should do and what you shouldn't do in terms of your job. And then she's scolding the boys and then trying to urge them and then trying to put the family together and then trying to assert her ideas. I mean, she's all over the place. And to make those quick things, I mean, it's rather fun to do, to be honest, because it means that, you know, in acting, the most important thing is to be in the moment and not anticipate the next moment on stage, um, to not have a performance um, pat down pat because then it's not you're not acting you're you're redoing what you did the night before so it really forces you and it's great fun to stay in that moment moment by moment and make those changes as they happen I absolutely love that idea because it's such a I think it's a fantasy for a lot of academics that we would get to act in the plays we study so for me I'm, I'm like, I'd be really curious what your fantasy would be but I'd love to play Lyman Felt maybe that's a reflection of my own <laughs> Really neuroses. No, I, I, I'm, I'm very <laughs> curious because that's one of the plays. To be honest, and maybe I should make concessions on this in this interview, but that's one of the plays that I find most problematic, and and actually one of my sorry Miller least favorite plays of his. So I really oh. want to know why you want to play Lyman Felt. This is fascinating. I think he's just he's got this exuberance and this life about him that, as much as I enjoy the Archbishop ceiling. Um, four intellectuals sitting around in a stuffy room doesn't do, or <laughs> the price, or the or incident at Vichy right. plays I really love, but they don't have that fun and jollity. And my number two choice would be Felix in Resurrection Blues. Oh, oh, oh that, because, that's a much that's a much better choice. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think they're great fun. Do you, do you have one, Ambika? I I don't know. I don't want to say it because uh, while I was writing my PhD dissertation, I fell head over heels for Sylvia Gelberg to an extent that I made a Facebook ID Sylvia Gelberg. So <laughs> yeah, I mean it's interesting yeah. too because I mean I would actually love to do Linda again in a different, uh, you know, completely different um, setting. Uh, different direction, everything. I think it would be, and, and usually I don't like to repeat, you know, well, it wouldn't be repeating, but usually I don't like to repeat what I do, but I would like to, I would love to do um, Sylvia in Broken Glass. And then I'm oh, also she's curious. She's amazing. About, <laughs> yes. And I, and actually it's interesting because I think that Harvey 
then had remembered, and I don't know why we did it, but a few years before Salesman, there was a library week. And somehow he and I, and I, I, I think I, I don't know how it began, but anyway, he and I did um, the scenes from Broken Glass together. And oh, he is nice. a powerful, I mean, he loves to yell on stage. And so there I am sitting in a chair as if it's a wheelchair. And when he would, you know, yell in his character, Sylvia, I mean, it would just, yeah. So we had that little bit of experience, but she, that that's an incredible role, I think. And then I'm also would be curious to do the price sometime. I mean, that's my favorite play of all time of Miller's, but I'm, I'm really fascinated again with her um, in, in terms of, again, the same kinds of issues that we've spoken about so far to what degree, does she support her husband? To what degree you know, does she feel trapped, but she's trying to play by the rules? And then, of course, that shattering moment. I mean, I can feel it now, the shattering moment when she, I mean, I just feel like she loses her breath, realizing, wait, you knew your father had, I mean, I'm ready to cry right now, had something. And all of those years, you know, and which reflects, as you know, what Sylvia says, this is a life we're talking about. And they're finally talking, but where did the last 20, 30 years go? So I, I think, I actually think that more people who write about Miller should go ahead and, and act in plays and scenes and, and things. Okay. Maybe we need all, to do that all, at a... All in one one play together, all of us in one play together. That would be interesting. We could start that. I think that's great. So that, that's, your next, that's your next project. Start, so we'll do online readings of plays, which it's interesting too, because, you know, we've seen, we've all seen some productions that are, are read now and on Zoom. And, and it's great to, to keep, that energy going, but they are problematic. It's not the same as, as a fully stage. That being said, I was just going through some of my files and, and decades ago um, when I was at, at university, I wrote, um, a, I was in a reader's theater course and I wrote a reader's theater script for Animal Farm. And I suddenly realized this last week, wait a minute, we had reader's theater as, as a viable kind of theater. So maybe we can bring that into Zoom. And instead of trying to uh, forget that we're not on stage, not even try to be on stage, but do reader's theater. Anyway, yeah. that's a little bit off, off No, topic. no, <laughs> that would be great. It just reminds me, I actually, I saw The Man Who Had All The Luck in Dublin years ago and a reader's, yeah, and just, re they read it in the basement of the Abbey and it was great because it's a great play. But yeah, getting back to um, another one of Miller's early plays, and this is something that just really, it surprised me when I first read it and it surprises me now, but in All My Sons, Miller has Kate Keller down as mother in the script. So her dialogue is indicated by mother. And this just strikes me as being so perfectly Freudian. Um, but do you know, is there any particular reason for this decision? You know, I, <clears throat> I don't have a full answer to that. Um, one of the most wonderful experiences I've had where I learned more about writing than any of the writing books or, or courses or things that I've taught was to go down to the archives um, in Texas, where you can see Miller's drafts and notes and everything. And this was before the final submissions where they sent everything else down there, which now, you know, but before there were 81 boxes or so. And I went through, you had to fill out a card for each item you wanted. And when, when the woman finally saw me um, um, filling them all out, she said, what are you doing? I said, I want to see everything. You know, I'm here for five days I, I, because my way of doing research is not looking for what I'm looking for, but just to kind of open myself up to see what's there and then go from there. And so she actually had all of the boxes brought out like 10 at a time. So I went through everything. I actually ended up cataloging kind of, you know, in general what was there. And it was it was wonderful to look through those papers. But and then you can actually have some copies made. But I was focused on other plays for my dissertation and all my sons was not one of the major six only three of which fit into my dissertation. So I have another book to write. Um, but I do know that he would change names. And I do know that he would uh, make them more individualistic. That being said, I also noticed in After the Fall, once you mentioned this, After the Fall, that um, it's mother and father. Now it's both parents. And so I, I don't, I wouldn't make that big of a deal of it necessarily. I know that we can interpret it and, and, and everyone's free to do that. Um, I, I just think that I, I mean it's a it's a good question. I, I think I think in some ways that mother then lacks a kind of individualistic treatment. It is the mother, and a lot of as one of the um, critics pointed out, you know, a lot of the plays are centered in the home 
where even though the father comes in and, and he's in charge in some ways, no, the mother is the one at the center of that home. So I don't, but I'm, I'm curious um, in terms of, of the analysis of, of um, Freudian, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I just find it so strange that out of all his characters, he would identify one of these fictional people who he's writing this story about with this really deeply personal name. She could have any name, but to place mother, because mother is such a personal word. You only use mother to refer to one person. Right. So just to make that decision to place mother in the play, even though at the start of the, when he lists the characters, it's it, Joe Keller, Kate Keller, Chris Keller. It's just, I just always found it really strange. And it's interesting because I read it the other way that mother is an archetype. And so it's less personal, but I love, I love hearing your interpretation. That's fascinating. Well, yeah. And maybe we're getting too deep into my own psychosis now. Well, so. no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. I, you know what, what I would like to do, and I, I, I do want to go back down to Texas and, and again, look through all the new stuff as well. Um, but then I'm really curious because I would like to review then, I don't think I have copies here of those pages. I'd like to review then his early drafts of that uh, again, because it was just fascinating to see how, how the drafts emerge and how they change, which, you know, that's, that's another paper. That's another theory. <laughs> I think it is both personal and as you say, an archetype to call her mother. It is strange though, to, uh, you know, at the start of the play, you don't understand it and you find it a little uh, odd that the name yes. is mother. <laughs> but yes. Yes. As, as you, as you understand what he's trying to say and what, how he has characterized the person, so you see it as a, as I think I see it, at least I see it as a largely accepted definition of what a mother would be like. Well, and her so, main focus is that she does not want that her son has died. That is her main, you know, concern and her main role. And, and everything else has to go around that. All of her denial, all of her challenge, all of her, her commenting to, you know, Chris, because, you know, if he's gone, then your father's responsible, as I paraphrase, you know, poorly. So, yeah, these, these you know, it, it's a small little thing, but yet, you know, Karen, it's not, is it? And so this is fascinating. I love these discussions. Yes. So in Miller asserted in... Uh, 1985, that his female characters were not intended to be played sentimentally and that there was a more sinister side to the women in his plays. How do you regard this view? Because he himself never agreed to uh, how people perceived his female characters. Right. I mean, you know, I, I give him a lot of credit because, you know, having created these plays, um, he largely let directors and actors find their way through them, even when he was in rehearsals. You know, he would offer some ideas and everything. And you can see that um, in some recordings. But um, yes, he let them get on with it. Um, it's interesting because I'm not sure I would agree with his self-assessment of sinister. Um, OK, so who is sinister? Abigail. Um, that's one reading. Um, and, you know, but then that but then we're back to, again, such a pejorative view of the women characters that I don't know that's there. Um, and, and, and also in terms, we forget, you know, what the women want, you know, it, it, in other words, is there a single Miller female character who is doing something negative or that could be viewed as bad or unethical to hurt somebody else. To me, that's what sinister is. And I don't see that in any of these female characters. I see that they're operating out of their own desires, out of their own fears, out of their own um, emotional or economic needs. Um, you know, are, are they good characters? You know, good, ethical? No, but neither are the men and neither are we all the time. <laughs> so we're back to that, that human condition. So that's really, I find that now not being played sentimental, um, I think there again is an indication that that he saw the strength in his characters, um, women characters. That being said, again, I, ha I have to credit uh, Steve Marino with this when we were talking, because he said that, um, and it's in an interview, 60 minute interview, that Miller, when he saw Elizabeth Franz in the 50th anniversary production um, of Death of a Salesman on Broadway, which I saw twice, um, once, once in the balcony, and then I needed to go see it again. So a few days later, 
um, standing room only in the orchestra, completely different feel experience, just having a different seat. Um, but he, Miller said that Elizabeth Franz brought out things in the character that he had never seen. And one, I think that's remarkable and wonderful. And two, for him to admit it um, is fantastic to, for him to admit that publicly. I mean, there again, you know, that, that play is elastic. Uh, every, every good work of literature is elastic, right? That every time we look at it, every time we see it, whether it's on stage or we're reading it ourselves, we see something more, we examine something more. I, I also feel that he did not mean sinister completely. Like I, I think he just, and also he's saying it very clearly that he is talking about a sinister side and not a sinister character. So Good the point. characters, yeah, he, he is not calling them wholly sinister, that they are evil characters. They are, they're doing this. They, they just have a side to themselves, which is, slightly evil, not as nice as everyone perceives them to be. Right. You're, yeah, that's a that's a good point to contrast that sentimentality with that. And again, none of the characters is. We aren't. We all have our strengths. We all have our foibles. We have our parts that even we cringe about that we'd like to change in ourselves. So, yeah. And kind of building on from that, the there seems to be a common criticism that I don't think is massively well-founded, that he presents women as kind of good wives or seductresses. For instance, in The Ride Down Mount Morgan, people say that about Lyman's wives, even though we see throughout that both Leia and Theo, the pair of them, are intelligent and attractive. But So do you, how do you think his portrayal of women changes and does it become more complicated over the years? And this is, sorry, this is going to be about four questions in one. So you can take <laughs> this in any way you like. Um, but does this reflect his own relationship with his wives? Um, for instance, we could talk about Elizabeth Proctor and Mary Slattery. And in, just in terms of the Crucible specifically, is this to, in some way an attempt to justify his ending his first marriage? And then leading on from that, we can't really have this conversation with asking about how big an impact Marilyn Monroe has on his drama after the mid-50s. So... Sorry, that's a lot, but take it <laughs> however you like. That's that's a book in itself. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think seeing the women characters as either or again is too simplistic. I think that again we're seeing male characters trying to understand the women in their lives, trying to understand the roles those women play. Why? Why am I going to be unfaithful? Or have I been unfaithful to my wife that I love, that I treasure, but yet, wow, there's this temptation out here. What is that about? Is it, you know, to make me feel um, better about myself? You know, the, I mean, the stereotypical thing, yeah, that the, the wife has to, you know, make the finances work and she's bugging the husband. So then, but this woman out here, she doesn't have that need. So, you know, I don't have to think about all of those things. Um, but I, I think the male characters are trying to understand um, beyond, uh, they might stereotype them, but they're trying to understand the women beyond those stereotypes of good wife or seductress or you know um, angel and whore, whatever whatever you want to want to say. I'm I'm reminded of my actual my first topic for my dissertation that I was accepted for to go over and study with uh, Christopher Bigsby was on women characters. And after a few months, then I wrote a paper on a completely different topic. And so I went in that direction. Um, but I was a little dismayed. There was very little at the time. This goes back to 1997 to 1998. There was very little uh, criticism written on women characters. But I remember one in particular that really just flummoxed me. And it referred to kind of, and I'm paraphrasing, part of this I'm paraphrasing, the other, forgive my language, is um, how dare Miller write, quote unquote, sperm stealing Abigail, end quote. <laughs> I was shocked, not, not just because, again, this is, you know, all those years ago in the language, but, but what? <laughs> um, and, and I thought, wait a minute, this critic, and it was a woman, was actually condemning Abigail more than the play does at all. And so, so that kind of, again, fortunately, you know, the, the literary, uh, the, the literary criticism has developed since then, but that either, or in other words, and I think it's much more complex. First of all, it leaves out daughters. 
Um, it, it leaves out other roles that the women play. Second, I think the men are trying to come to terms with, again, the roles that these women have in their lives and to what degree they themselves are culpable for these relationships that, that, that they go, for example, outside um, the marriage. Um, in terms of um, connecting it with Miller's life, obviously, and this is something almost every, if not every writer faces, you start with something in your life and inside of five minutes or 10 minutes or a month or something, it goes in a completely different direction. It has nothing to do. So I've written some things, for example, and people, oh my gosh, Jane, how long have you had that disease? I don't have that disease. I wrote a <laughs> script about it, you know? Um, and so I think obviously, yes, we can look at after the fall and, and we can look at, you know, as you say, um, all of the, the women in say Miller's life, you could, you could trace through some of the characters but then at the same time, again, what is the difference between, um, uh, I'm kind of going off topic, but between archetypes and breaking down those archetypes. That being said, I mean, biographical criticism is interesting and it has its place. I think when people go too far, it almost becomes a kind of voyeurism, a kind of gossip, and it misses the, it's misguided and it misses the point of the work of literature as an art. Um, and I think if people want you know, I would recommend right now, if people want to know more about Miller's relationships with his wives, um, Christopher Bigsby has written a very thorough two-volume, wonderful biography. Um, he knew Miller very, very well. And, and, um, and, and he lays out a lot of what was happening in that period. And so I think that's kind of a, a safer thing to be. By the way, too, um, one of the things that's coming up in the new Arthur Miller journal is a fest shrift um, in which we're honoring Christopher Bixby for all of his incredible work over the years. And so, and I was um, fortunate enough to do um, the interview with him for that volume. And so that'll be coming out in about three or four weeks. And so uh, that might be of some interest to a lot of people there. So. Um, oh no, absolutely. Thank you so much for that plug. And I definitely agree with you um, about the, it, the plays being more important as literature and drama than biography. So when I was doing my PhD, I wrote on some kind of love story and it just seemed that everyone decided, Oh, it's a woman with mental health problems. She has to be Marilyn Monroe. Right. And right. We're, yeah. You know, there are more interesting things to say about Arthur Miller right. than he was married to Marilyn Monroe. Right. And, and going back, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, there can't be a single moment <laughs> in which we don't bring her up when they were married for, I think, five years. And um, and he wrote some of the characters that that could be compared to her before he even knew her. You know, some of the early plays had some characters that were similar. Um, and, I, and it, you know, yes, we all say, you know, why did they put Barbara Loden in a blonde wig, for heaven's sake, and, and all of that. And um, and there again, I mean, I would ascertain um, or assert that that Miller there, you know, and here on now I'm doing a little bit what I'm what I rail against is that Miller was also trying in that play to work out these relationships in his own life. But yet at the same time, that doesn't mean that it's absolutely autobiographical. He said all of his plays together are, are his autobiography, but that's not quite true. Um, yeah, so I, I just think that there's a, again, as I said before, we missed the point of that work as as literature. And how important was Miller's mother to both his life and writing? We often talk about Marilyn Monroe's influence on his work and we compare every female character in his plays to her. Uh, but we do not often talk about uh, the influence that his mother had on him and, uh, and his writing and the characters that he created, the women characters that he created. Augusta Miller did not work outside the home. And although she was in many ways more worldly and more accomplished than her husband, Isadora, but uh, there's very little that we know about her. So would you like right. to Right. I mean, he opens, he opens time bends. I mean, I love when I, when I teach um, autobiography in a creative writing class, I love the way that that first page and a half of his autobiography time bends where he's looking, he doesn't identify what it is, but his earliest memory where he's looking up, you know, and there's a voice up there. I mean, the, the opening few pages are just tremendous. And um, certainly, you know, arranged marriages, uh, were more common, especially among um, immigrants to the country. Um, and so she did not know that her husband was illiterate. 
Um, she, I believe, wanted to further her own education. I mean, again, we can see parts of her in some of Miller's plays, and then we really have to do the research to know to what degree, you know, are we going to read um, Rose completely in American Clock, for example, or, or The Price and, and other plays. Um, she did go to, she played the piano. She loved to go to theater when they, when they lived um, before they had to move to Brooklyn. Um, and she would bring home, you know, the sheet music and, and they'd play and sing. Um, and so certainly that introduction to theater and to books, um, even though as, as we have read, Miller was not the best high school student. He was more interested in football at that point. But certainly that is a grounding. I think that influence is, is, is very much there. Um, but yeah, uh, in terms of, of when he was actually writing his plays and everything, that interaction, I don't know about. Yeah. It is interesting that he seems to, um, after the, the college plays, he seems to stray away from drawing fairly strict depictions of his parents, except for maybe in the American clock. But I think it's also interesting that his younger sister, Joan Copeland became an actress and eventually, like you say, played Rose based on her own mother in the original production of The American Clock. Um, do you know, did she, quote unquote, follow Miller into the theatre? And what was their relationship like? Um, Steve Marino did an incredibly wonderful interview with Joan Copeland a few years ago, and it actually is in the spring edition of the 2008. And it's wonderful. I, I, was, I was reading it um, again this weekend. And in it, she talks about that um, her brother had to have piano lessons and he missed them and the piano teacher came. So the mother made her have the piano lesson. And when Arthur came home, Joan said, well, hi, I had your piano lesson. Good. You can have all of them. So she started playing the piano and she really practiced for hours a day and wanted to become a concert pianist. And at one point, um, as she told, tells Steve in that interview, um, she realized no matter how much she was going to practice that she, she wouldn't pay, you know, $15, I think it was to hear herself play. So why would anybody else? And so she kind of had to give that up. And then um, she was with her husband. I think it was in Texas, if I'm remembering correctly. And someone needed a quote unquote, pretty girl to cross the stage. And so she walked across the stage and fell in love with, as she says, the adulation. And, um, you know, Miller did not tap her to audition for his plays. Um, it's interesting, again, you know, she kept the name Copeland and, and, and really, you know, it's, it's, they, they tried to keep it separate uh, for several reasons, I imagine. And, but then, you know, he said, hi, you know, there's a, there's a role for you in a play. And that was American Clock. And I also love it, what she reports is that Miller came up to her after one rehearsal, said, what are you doing? She said, I'm playing our mother. He said, that's not our mother. And of course, that's what we all learn. We all have different mothers, even if they're the same person. And so those dynamics. So then she had to kind of say, okay, wait a minute. Okay, who's the mother in this play? You know, which again, you want to talk about biographical <laughs> influencing a reading of a character. There we have an autobiographical reading of a character. And there again, that, that leads me to another thought, which is even if we're playing real people, quote unquote, and we have all of the research for a real person and the play itself um, allows for that, well, when does it still become a work of art? And, and how, how close, you know, again, are we just uh, doing mimicry? Or are we creating a, a character in a play, in a work of art? I was reading one interview of uh, Joan Copeland, and uh, she says about her character and the, you know, how she sees the character that she played. Uh, and she comments on how her brother saw the character. She says, I was a girl, Arthur was a boy. We see our mother differently. I saw my mother as very encouraging to all of us. As described in the play, there was a kind of competition between us that is normal between a girl of 13 or 15 and her mother. I play her. Well, I at first played her as I remembered her, but now I've got to play Arthur's Rosebaum, not my Rosebaum. Yes. So yes. I think yeah. she, she interpreted the character, but they both saw their mother in the character. I mean, and, and those there again, I mean, the, the fertile... Um, elements in all of those dynamic shifting. And, and when the playwright brother is alive in those rehearsals for the first time with 
the actress daughter. I mean, it's just fascinating. Yes, it is. Edel Billig, artistic director and actress, uh, Illinois Theater Center, I think she also founded this theater center, if I'm not wrong, said that there are no victims amongst M Miller's women. It is the men who commit suicide in his place. The women are the survivors. How do you regard this view of his female characters? It's a completely different view. I think it's something I never thought of, to be honest. I think it's an excellent point. Um, I think it also reveals, I mean, here's some more, more depth for actresses to explore and literary critics as well. I think it also reveals to what degree men in these plays, in some of these plays, for example, feel that if they do not succeed in a certain way, according to certain parameters, that their only way out, their only way to uh, save face, save their name, um, is to commit suicide, that they don't have the ability to admit their quote unquote failures and to go through the incredibly traumatizing, challenging path of working a different relationship out with their sons and that they've also failed their sons. So Willie thinks that his life insurance money is going to then allow Biff to start. Well, the question that I raise is um, life insurance policies. And I have, you know, I need to go back and still do much more research on this, but life insurance policies, if someone commits suicide are often invalid. And so I'd have to go back to that period of time to see. Um, and, and so, and, and then again, you know, with Chris and, and, and all my sons and the women again, in some ways are, more resilient. Maybe it's because, and again, I'd have to think about it. Maybe it's because that they have had to be resilient all along and, and respond to whatever's happening with their husbands, perhaps, and boy, this is a, a sexist thing to say, perhaps they have a different kind of survival mode because of their children. Um, again, that's somewhat a sexist thing to say. So forgive me, because I'd have to think about that at greater length, or what we could do is push these more current interpretations to show that the women are just a hell of a lot stronger than the men. I think that's really possible. And just when you mentioned that these men can't find a way to have a better relationship with their sons, it just, that's the kind of comment that always strikes me because I'm uh, one of two brothers. And so when I started reading Salesman and all my sons, when I was 18, 19, it really, really struck me. And I think, um, it's funny, actually, we've interviewed the majority of people we've interviewed uh, for the podcast have been women. But it just strikes me that that uh, dynamic that he sets up in those early plays is so striking to uh, a lot of young male readers, uh, myself included. Um, but kind of following on from that, we don't see a female bigamist or a disloyal wife in Miller's plays. Is this because he only wrote about traits that he admired in women and not about their vices? Or was there any other, was there anything else going on there, do you think? I, I don't think it's that the, he only saw the uh, the female characters that he admired, because again, the female characters are flawed as well. Um, and, and in some instances, maybe some of their mea culpas are um, due to, uh, maybe they could be seen as, again, um, patronizing a little bit, you know, so to what degree does Elizabeth Franz, you know, is, is she really culpable in her husband's, um, you know, affair, et cetera. Um, and so some of that, I think I, I, I'd be curious to examine more, but, but none of the characters, all of the characters have flaws. Um, and I, it's interesting too, because this kind of contradicts again, uh, a lot of the criticism that is kind of an either or. Um, I also think too, that, that, these faults in women have existed throughout kind of Miller's place, you know, again, I, and, and yet at the same time, what are the women supposed to do in the roles that they're in? But the same thing can be said of men. If men are to survive economically in this world that has so many pressures upon them, what else were they supposed to do? How, you know, um, I mean, you know, Chris says to, to his father, but, but I thought you were better 
than this, you know, that, that you were my father, you weren't like all the others, but, but what is a man supposed to do? So again, those, you know, one of the wonderful things that so many of us appreciate about Miller's work is that intersection between uh, personal and social, between sociological and psychological. So I, I think again, yeah, <laughs> I think, I think that they're much more complex. They are, they indeed are. Uh, you note in your article on working women in Miller's plays that not all Miller husbands argue to keep their wives from working. And you mentioned Victor from The Price, who urges Esther to get a job, even something part-time, recognizing that it would get her out of the house. Uh, do you think there is sometimes a tendency to generalize male characters in Miller's plays as uncaring patriarchs who do not want their women to grow and be independent? Do people miss the complexity in both his male and female characters, like how we ended the last answer? Right. I mean, that, again, that's a, that's a really interesting and very good question, I think, because early on, for example, in, in the play That They May Win, which was in 1943, the woman needs to go out to earn money for the family, but her husband is adamant that she not. And he's unable to work. And so he finally has to agree to this and that he will stay home until such time as he can work. And there again, you can see what is a man's place? What are the expectations on the man? I have to be the breadwinner. If I am not the breadwinner, then I'm not a real man. If I'm not the strong one who's bossing everyone around, I'm not the real man. I'm not in charge of this family. And and those expectations Again, the, the pressure they exude on the man, as I said a few minutes ago, the, the, and then the suffocation on both him and the woman, so that neither one really has a chance to explore who they are. So, so I, again, I think that Miller is presenting what is happening in America in the 20th century with these roles, and, but what he's showing is how they fail for the men. and how the women are, are bumping up against them and wanting something else, wanting something different, wanting their own purpose, wanting to be them, themselves beyond being a wife and a mother, which they treasure, but they, they want something else. And, and yeah, I mean, we're human beings, so <laughs> everyone should. It's, it's funny. I wrote my master's thesis on masculinity in some of the later plays. And I, I made that argument that, well, here's the, the male ideal and this is how terrible it works for Miller's characters when they try to match it. So I never quite understood this idea that he was glorying in hegemonic masculinity because yeah. I think there's that line about Biff wanting to be outside with his shirt off, but it's not Biff's play, it's Willie's play. And it's not about how being outside with your shirt off is great. It's about how trying to achieve some ideal is a disaster for a lot of men. Right. I mean, it's interesting too, this idea, this point of view came to me actually several years ago, um, I was teaching an intro to lit class. We were teaching Doll's House by Ibsen. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're haranguing on, um, on Helmer, you know, how awful he is. And a man stood up in the back of the row in the class. He said, hang on a second. She is repaying all of that money that he earned. And light bulbs went off. And so I started at that point, um, what I called, and I always put it in brackets, on my list of literary critical schools, the new male school of criticism, where we look at things from a male's point of view, not, and some students misunderstood and they, they went the chauvinistic route. That's not what I'm talking about, but to look at exactly those pressures that then, how do they respond to those pressures? And I've often said for the past 25 years that we need a men's movement. We've had several women's movements and yes, we're backtracking on a lot of that, right? And going forward and, and, and I still can't believe that we are not further along in the year 2021. However, we haven't had a men's movement where men are free, or free, freer to make those kinds of decisions without negative views on their quote unquote masculinity. I mean, so if, if a man sews, what does that mean? You know, I, I mean, I know, for example, on a personal note, um, I, I was a flutist in high school and, you know, we had one uh, one boy flutist. And yet, if you look and there are lots of reasons for this, if you look at the great flutists who are well known in the world, I'm going to get in trouble here. They're men. 
Now, part of that is also a lot of the stereotypes and the restrictions on women. I know my father talked, he was a musician. He talked years and years ago about a clarinetist, a female clarinetist he knew who auditioned. This is probably going back to the 50s audition for a major orchestra and it was always behind screens that you audition so they were blind auditions except they weren't one foot of the screen below was empty and they saw women's shoes she didn't ever got the the role so they're all of those but at the same time you know when when can we just be and like what we like without these very narrow definitions of masculine and feminine oh i agree completely um but kind of moving on then to his to some of the later plays that we've mentioned, in works like The Last Yankee and Broken Glass, women appear broken, they appear depressed. His portrayal demonstrates a particular sensitivity at this point to women's, to to the female character's situation, and especially to the increasing number of women suffering from depression. And does this represent a change in how he writes his women and can you talk about maybe some reasons you think for that change occurring? Um, I actually think that going back through his plays throughout his long career, that other women are depressed. So you look at after the fall, you know, definitely with Maggie Um, crucible, you could make um, an argument um, uh, for that. Uh, View from the Bridge, Salesman Sons. I mean, I think the women are suffering from some depression. I think the difference is that except for After the Fall, that in these later plays, as you mentioned, Last Yankee and Broken Glass, the there is more perspective, more time given, um, uh, more focus on the women um, and the women who are suffering depression. And, and, and I think that also can reflect again, a more openness from, say, the 40s to the 60s to the 90s of our willingness, our our knowledge of looking at mental illness, which I also, again, um, I, I might get in trouble for this as well, but I make a distinction between mental illness and emotional illness. I think they're related, but I, I think they're different. And I think that's important to, to note. But, you know, uh, I'm not I'm not a trained psychologist. So um, that's an assertion that that people might really not appreciate. Um, the other thing is The Last Yankee, of course, at first was a one act play and it was just the men in the waiting room waiting to see their wives. Um, so we would get only their perspective. And then with the addition of the second act, now, you know, we can say, wait a minute. You know, we can see even more. Maybe we're not believing or trusting what the men's perspectives are of their wives. And so I, I, I think it's I think it's fascinating. I see it quite. I, I feel that he even in this, he had a very it was a practical worldview that he saw wherever he went, he saw more number of women who were depressives. So he you know, he took that theme up. I, I don't think it was his view of women. It was what he saw around him, that there were right. more number of women suffering clinical depression. So he showed women depressives. But at the same time, he shows the emotional depression of men also in the play. So it's not only clinical depression, it's also emotional depression. And he can very well be judged by some trained psychologists that why did you you know portray it this way and why would you not not say this about the illness? But I think it's more of a social depiction of how the illness is and and not not a very clinical depiction. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And also, I mean, you want to talk depression? Willie Loman, nineteen forty nine. You know, <laughs> Kate uh, uh, Joe Keller, nineteen forty seven. So yeah, I mean, the men. You know, they wouldn't have labeled it as the, the, the male characters themselves, of course, would never have labeled it depression. But of course. But yeah, I mean, if, if suicide doesn't come from depression, I'm not sure where it comes from, you know? Um, yeah. Yes. And do Miller's older plays need to be updated in terms of their gender roles if they are to retain their power and relevance? I don't think so. <laughs> um I have, I have two responses to that. I don't think so. One, I, I tend personally, I, I guess full full disclosure, I tend to be um, on the more traditional conservative side. Okay, so there is that lens I'm looking at, but also the plays are universal still, and 
Um, I mean, you know, um, as as I as I said to, uh, in, in other situations, you know, neighbors who have never read Miller would come home from a traveling trip saying, "Oh, I feel like Willie Loman." You know, and so Willie Loman's part of our culture, and there are, there are other plays that are just universal. And universality is is one of the few criteria I have if if someone says, you know, what what constitutes great literature. And I also think that there is value in not updating everything all the time, because if we try to update everything all the time, and there's a value in, in updating, but I'll get to that in a minute. But if we try to update everything all the time, then we miss one of the great points, which is how to what degree, even though life has changed drastically for human beings in the last 110 years, to what degree is, is the human condition the same as it has been for thousands of years? So that when we re- read Greek plays, when we read Shakespeare, when we read Ibsen, when we read um, Miller, when we read, you know, other great playwrights and other great writers in, in all genres, that that universality, I think, is something I know that my students are shocked. I know I started assigning um, Grapes of Wrath. Um, and then after I'd already ordered it from the bookstore, 2008, economic decline happened. And my students, um, a, a number of them, um, their families are working in the fields. Um, you know, in California. And they looked at this book at first, you know, it's so thick. How are they going to read it? They looked at this book and they said, oh my gosh. I said, yes, these things have happened before. You know, Annika, and if we don't learn from history, then we repeat history. We're seeing this. I'm wondering if we ever are going to learn from history. That's an, another whole topic. But I, I think there's there's a value in having them located where they are. That being said, um, so I don't think they need to be updated, to be honest. I guess that's I mean, and people can play with that. People have been playing with that. Um, I just think that then if they're going to, they need to be very careful about what their intention is. Sometimes, for example, um, and I've known this for 30 years, some directors try to do, for example, with Shakespeare. I saw Shakespeare, I think, in the 80s in spandex on roller skates. And I thought, okay. Interesting, fun, different. Yes, you've put your stamp on it, but I'm not sure why. I could not ever make a connection. Trust me, I can make a symbolic connection between anything. So I think that they have to have an intention of why they're doing it and that they have to make sure that that directorial concept either illuminates something in the play that we haven't noticed. And even if it skews the play so our focus is on something completely different, that's fine for production. That's wonderful. Or that it serves the play. I also feel that there is no need to update Mirror's plays. <laughs> it would just be a you know useless experiment. I, I don't think everything needs to be updated. What do you think about it, Kyo? No, I don't really think so. I think, as you say, if it illuminates it, if it is interesting. But a couple of years ago, there was a version mm-hmm. of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf that was played in our theatre festival here in Dublin. And it was this ultra-absurdist nonsensical, completely changed the meaning, took the fun out of it. Nonsense. And I spoke to a lot of people who went to it. They all said, I don't know why this was done. It doesn't add anything. I think it was flattering to a certain sensibility, which was fine, but it didn't add anything to the to the art of the play. It was everyone's fine with Virginia Woolf. I don't know if you saw that, Jane. It was in no. it was in New York and it came to Dublin. And I just, everyone I was in the, the pub with afterwards, we just thought, well, what was that? Did that, <laughs> was that more entertaining than Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Of course. Well, and not. that might be, that might be the very word, Karen, is that maybe it becomes, again, almost pure entertainment versus something that is art. I mean, well, what's the definition of art? I know I've just stepped into it now. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll let you bypass that one because I'm curious. I wanted to ask as well. Do you get much pushback from your students um, when either doing Miller or Salesman that these plays are too male centric and, you know, pity the poor straight white man? Is that something that crops up in your in your classes? I've I've never had that. I have never had that. Um, Maybe it's partly to do that. um, Most of my students um, say in intro to literature had never read a play. Um, And so it's new so that they're not as apt to, you know, um, criticize something in that way. Um, 
I, I didn't. And even, I mean, one of the things that I, I loved doing when I taught the course in person, and at first it was extra credit and then it became mandatory. Um, I made every student act in a 10 minute scene and I would cast the students according to what roles I thought that they either could get their teeth into or that they would enjoy or something. And then I had, it it became very time consuming, but I had then little short mini rehearsals with each group. They could have their scripts in hand, but I also, you know, following the Uta Hagen method, because I find it very useful is to have actually the props or something that they're actually doing because we're rarely talking and not doing anything else. Um, And it was fascinating because I mean, the students, some of the students were just hysterically petrified at the thought. And every time after we finished, they begged to do more. And one of the things, again, is when, when, and I actually had started this because when I taught at a boarding school, I was allowed to start a junior level course um, that was an English course, but it was an acting course. And I thought that I would get, and some of them might hear this recording, won't like what I'm going to say. I thought I would get the strongest students No, I got the students who could not write essays the year before. And I thought, oh, my gosh. And I remember one one boy in particular, I will not say his name, but he could not write very well at all. I think he got a D from me the year before. And once he acted in Brighton Beach Memoirs, did a 10 minute scene, when he went to write that paper, he knew that character because he asked this whole slew of questions. And so that connection that I had an instinct, something was there. So again, back to the the college in that intro to lit class, when they would act these roles. And then again, we can see them right in front. I never graded them on acting. I told them that from the beginning, but we're just watching and you're experiencing this from the inside out. Not at all. I, I never got that pushback. Is a long answer to your short question. <laughs> no, that's that's a that's a great answer. I'm I'm really really happy to hear it. How useful or interesting? Getting back to experiments in theater, how useful or interesting could gender swapping be in Miller's plays? Has this been done much? Uh, for instance, has there been any death of a saleswoman? Well, um, and again, I was I, I was uh, talking with Steve about this when we were speaking on the phone a few days ago, and and he reminded me that when we had our last uh, Miller conference in Ashland University at Ashland, Ohio, where Carlos Campo is president as well, as well as a Miller scholar, and and he and I had the we for the second time we uh, presented a series of readings of scenes, which was uh, uh, just so much fun. He's a great actor, um, but they did a production of Enemy of the People, Miller's adaptation of Ibsen's play. And because in a lot of theater departments, you have more women than men auditioning, and there are lots of male characters in that play. And so they gender swapped in that play for a lot of the roles. He also pointed out, too, that they had a a female, they didn't, but that there's been a female um, crucible production. But other than that, not so much. I mean, it's also interesting, too, because, of course, and I know that we're talking about, you know, women's roles uh, uh, this month, but... But it's interesting, too, because there, of course, is also the thing about what do you do with race um, in plays in terms of casting. And so, you know, the uh, American Clock production that had three families um, that was done um, in England. And I I'm, I need to um, uh, learn more about that because I'm preparing the uh, next Methuen a, a student edition of American Clock later this year. Um, the one thing that hasn't been done, I noticed too, um, in terms of swapping. So we we're doing genders, we're doing race, all of that's, you know, interesting and great. What about age? <laughs> I just want to put that out there, you know, because again, especially for actors, actresses that, you know, um, coming from Hollywood or whatever, once you're 30, that's it, you're done. And of course that's changing, thank goodness. Um, but anyway, just some, some interesting things about about, again, what is the value? What are we shining a light on? And certainly the universality. Yeah. So that's, that's really um, all I know about the, the gender swapping in productions right now. Well, I think in terms of age swapping, we could say that Lee J. Cobb was the first, because I think he was, wasn't he in his early forties or his late thirties when he played Willie? Right. I mean, he looks like he looked monumentally old because he had that rumpled way about him. Right. Right. But, and then yeah. same, same, same way with Dustin Hoffman. For me, and again, um, I, I, I might be unique in this, but he was um, too young for me. I know that the other thing that was interesting is I was when I was reading some of the more recent um, comments by actors and directors on gender and on the, the, you know, are the women's roles in Miller strong or not? 
um, it was interesting because they talked about, you know, big Willie and little Linda, if you go back to Mildred Dunnick. And yet, as we know, the original script was for a little Willie and a large woman playing Linda. And the stories that I love about that um, is that Mildred Dunnett came in and Kazan knew her and said, Mildred, this is not your role. So she came back again and they said, Mildred, it's not your role. She came back one day and she had padded herself to look like a bigger woman. And they didn't recognize her. And she started speaking. They said, Mildred, is that you? We told you this is not your role. But she kept on coming back and she got the role. And so, again, you know, you know, they had to change the, the shrimp line to walrus for Lee J. Cobb, then back to shrimp for Dustin Hoffman, then, then for Brian Dennehy back. And so then where another question is, to what degree does the physicality actually matter? You know, can a large, a physically large man, in fact, be a small man? And, and can a, a, a seemingly physically frail woman, I mean, you watch that recording in Mildred Dunnick and she takes no prisoners. I mean, she is strong in that role, I find. So, yeah, all, all of these, these externals, to what degree do they have to mirror and symbolize what's going on inside? Or, again, can we see them in a different way? And then that's another ironic element to point out about the characters. Yes, definitely. And um, just to finish up, I just want to ask, I'm curious, and we may have already touched on this in some of your answers, but do you think there are any great female roles in Miller's work that have not been given justice yet? I think it depends if we're, well, actually, I think I think the answer is um, yes. <laughs> and both in terms of literary criticism, there still is not a lot on women out there. Um, I've written three papers, I realized. And, and again, that was my original topic, as I said, for my dissertation. And then I've, I've gone far away from it. And now I realize that I've been conceiving the other chapters that eventually, you know, after I finish my other projects, perhaps. But I think literary criticism is, is one thing. And I know that, again, Steve Marino has presented, um, he published a guide to the essential criticism in which he maps out what's been done so far. But also on stage, which I find actually at present more fascinating. I think all of the characters, to be honest, the, the, the easy answer, which is not the most interesting one, is that I think they all can be um, explored more. But I'm most interested actually in four one act plays. Um, because I think they have very strong women characters, some kind of love story, elegy of a lady. I can't remember anything in Clara. And I think those, because they're one act plays, because as Miller said, nobody wants to, you know, get dressed up, go pay a lot for dinner and go into a movie, you know, or a theater in Broadway and pay all that money for one act. Well, then he put them two, you know, two together. But I think those most come to mind. Um, I think playing for time and then price and broken glass, I think, can still, I mean, we've had a lot of Kate Kellers and we've had a lot of Linda Lomans. We haven't had as many of the other characters portrayed. And so I think a lot of the nuances that we've um, started to um, identify today, um, find those pockets. I think that all is interesting, but yeah, I, if I had to, out of those three answers, the one that I'm most curious about is those, those, those four. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I think we're going to end it there. Jane Dominic, it's been great having you on and great to chat to you about Arthur Miller and all of his various women to celebrate Women's History Month. So thank you very much. You're welcome and thank you. This was such a pleasure. Thank you, Jane. It was an absolute pleasure listening to you and getting all the insights that you gave us. And uh, I, I hope this interview gives some direction to people to not judge Miller on his female characters. Right, and to continue to explore them. Absolutely. Yes, Such a pleasure yes. to meet both of you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Absolute Jane. pleasure. And that was our conversation with Jane Dominic. And we hit a lot of the core points on Miller and the portrayal of women in his plays. But I think this is such a broad topic. There's a lot more that can be said. What do you think about it, Kieran? Oh, for sure. And I think this is a subject that's going to get a lot more attention in coming years. And for me personally, I'm still really curious to see what could be done with Death of a Saleswoman or All My Daughters, those kinds of productions. So hopefully we'll be seeing them soon. Yes, absolutely. Death of a Saleswoman sounds very interesting to me. Well, that's all we have for today. The new issue of the Arthur Miller Journal, focusing on the life and career of Miller biographer, Professor Christopher Bigsby, including an interview with Jane Dominic, is due out this spring. Follow the Arthur Miller Society on Facebook and Twitter 
Listen to the podcast on Buzzsprout or Spotify or Google us to find the player that suits you best. Thanks so much for listening. We'll speak to you again soon. Bye, stay well.